Okay, Jim, we're ready to go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Jim Ginter. I am the supervisory archivist for the Dwight D. Eisenhower Presidential Library. And uh, welcome to you. Before we start, um, I just wanted to take a moment um, to mention that as it happens as we gather today for this program, that it is also the um, 55th anniversary of the death of President Eisenhower. And so I just thought, before we got started, and take a moment and uh, just take a moment of remembrance for President Eisenhower in his work um, on behalf of our country. Thank you. I want to welcome you all to the Eisenhower Presidential Library's Lunch and Learn program for March 28th, 2024. This year, our programming theme has been Waging Peace. And in this series, we're looking at some of the ways that President Eisenhower sought global peace. This month, we're looking at Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. President Eisenhower believed that, quote, Radio Free Europe and the Crusade for Freedom are vital to success in the battle for men's minds. With that in mind, today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Fomar, who will speak to us on the subject of broadcasting for freedom. Dr. Pomar is currently a senior fellow at the Clements Center for National Security at the University of Texas. He has taught international media at the Moody School of Journalism at the University of Texas and international politics at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Before I hand it over to Dr. Pomar, um, I just want to note that there are pads and pencils available on the tables for those here in the audience to jot down questions that you might have for Dr. Pomar later. And for those of you in the live stream, you'll be able to put your questions into the chat um, at the end of the program, which will address that. And with that, please, Welcome, Dr. Mark Pomar. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I am very honored and pleased to be with you. I wish I were there in person. I hope uh, sometime in the next couple of months to actually visit the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Archive. I'm working. I recently completed a book on Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and The Voice of America. And now I'm embarking on a new book, uh, looking at certain aspects of it. And the Eisenhower Library and Archives is a very important part. So I, I look forward to visiting the library and meeting many of you, all of you in person. Uh, I would like to sort of cast the talk in the sense that it's in incredibly relevant to today's uh, environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, President Eisenhower uh, in the 1940s and late 40s and early 50s was instrumental in uh, setting up the U.S. to be successful and uh, in the Cold War. And we are now back in many ways, and we can explore this in the question and answer period, we're back to another Cold War. And as I will show in the course of our discussion, many of the features that we are that were prevalent in the late 40s and early 50s are now back with a very aggressive Russia, with a dangerous China, with a dangerous Iran and so forth. So the lessons of the Eisenhower years, I think are especially, especially relevant today. And I think that uh, the topic that you have chosen is perhaps ideal for discussing the challenges that we face today. 
Uh, as many of you know, uh, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower was uh, a critical figure in many aspects uh, in terms of peace, including obviously his military prowess. But I would like to focus the theme today on radio, but broadly speaking, information, uh, reaching uh, audiences in unfriendly countries, enemy countries in some cases. And President Eisenhower knew better than really anyone else that if you're going to wage a Cold War and make sure that it is a peaceful Cold War, not a hot Cold War, but a cold Cold War, it's very important to balance your NATO alliance, which he believed in very strongly, your military defense and containment, which he felt was very strong, with a program designed, or programs perhaps, plural, designed to reach populations in the case of the Cold War, in primarily in the USSR, primarily in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but also in what we then call the Third World, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And he was an early proponent, uh, as Dr. Ginther pointed out, of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Uh, and in a sense, he understood that, and, and let me just briefly describe Radio for Your Radio Liberty, because they are amazingly interesting projects that uh, the U.S. was in the forefront of creating. They are, just, just to back down historically, a little bit of a background, after the end of, uh, end of World War II, in Western Europe, you had hundreds of thousands of displaced persons, DPs as they were called back then, people who had fled communist regimes in Eastern Europe, Poland, Baltic states, Czech Republic, Hungary, and so forth, or from the Soviet Union itself during World War II. They were living in camps in the American zone in Germany, and they were very eager to lend their knowledge and expertise to the U.S. in terms of opposing, fighting, resisting a communist aggression. And advisors to President Eisenhower, uh, C.D. Jackson in particular, and his archive is at the library, one that I would love to look at in greater detail, was really among the architects of creating what was then called home services. In other words, creating a radio station and a research operation in Munich, which was where the radios were, were uh, established, since that was where, where most of the displaced person camps were located, and to operate as if they were in the country to which they were broadcasting. So that, let's just take an example, the Polish service. You would have former Polish politicians, professors, journalists, writers, thinkers, living in these camps who would put together a program in the Polish language that would be broadcast to Poland as if it were broadcasting from within Poland in Warsaw. The same would be true for Hungary, the same would be true for the Czech Republic, back then Czechoslovakia, the same would be true for Russia, which was very important, the creation of a Russia service. And I will add Parenthetically, that in the early 1980s, I was head of the Russian service of Radio Liberty. So I actually worked in Munich in the building that President Eisenhower played such an important role in creating. Uh, also Ukraine. We now have this vicious war against Ukraine. The Ukrainian service was created at Radio Liberty to serve as a free and independent Ukrainian radio station broadcasting to the Ukrainian part of the Soviet Union. These were fundamental tools that were supported on many different levels. Uh, historically, if you are interested in the radios, I certainly will give a plug for my own book, which is called Cold War Radio, uh, University of Nebraska Press 2022, just came out about a year and a half ago. There are also other books, obviously, on, on the radios. Uh, if you look at YouTube, uh, you will see uh, familiar, some of you actually, my, my age, uh, my generation, you may recall uh, in the 1950s, there would be uh, advertisements, commercials on television that uh, would say Crusade for Freedom, which is what President Eisenhower headed initially, 
saying donate your dollars to the crusade for freedom and the liberty bell would be uh, shown and uh, i remember them i mean speaking personally i remember them they came we used to come on right before uh the lone ranger at 5 30 and i was four four five six year old kid who still remembers seeing them in 1955 and 56. on youtube you can see some personalities like ronald reagan uh speaking on behalf of the radio so this was a campaign that really uh was headed by by president eisenhower he supported it during his eight years as president and um, initially, the most of the funding came from the CIA, which is a very interesting part of the story. Some of it was contributed by, by Americans and American corporations. But, and we can come back to it in the question and answer if you would like to know more detail about, about the radio. It's a very, they are functioning today. I, I, I wanna emphasize that the Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty is alive and well in Prague today. And it was successful during the end of the Cold War uh, we were honored, feted, uh, considered heroes. As a matter of fact, the reason why Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty is in Prague today is because Václav Havel, the first democratically elected president of the Czech Republic in the early 90s, gave a building in downtown Prague as a, a gift to the American people, a gift to the American people uh, to house Radio for Europe in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, in Prague for the work that we had done as Americans in supporting democracy and freedom in uh, Eastern, and uh, well, all the countries of uh, then under communist rule. Uh, so that the radios are now functioning. They are the go-to source for what is happening in Ukraine today, what is happening in Russia. They cover it better than anybody else. And so I think the legacy that was started under President Eisenhower back in the very late 1940s, early 1950s is alive and well, and he would be extremely proud of the work that they have done and the success that they have had and the work that they're continuing to do today. But I would also like to expand a little bit more on what President Eisenhower did in terms of peace through information, if you want to call it that, peace through contact. And I think what is oftentimes perhaps, well, not known as well as it should, is that President Eisenhower was the force, the person who helped create a very interesting agency of the United States government called USIA, US Information Agency, which was housed in Washington and its mandate was to be the spokesman, the conduit through which the rest of the world would know about American values, American culture, American views, American policies. It's a very ambitious effort. Uh, it was very much President Eisenhower's creation. It was created in 1953, soon after he was elected president. The first director of USIA was sworn in at the White House by the president himself. The first director attended meetings with the president and uh, as part of the National Security Council. And under USIA was the Voice of America and many, many other elements of information, if you wish, information policy. I also happen to have been an employee of USIA uh, for five years in the mid 1980s as the director of the Russian service of the Voice of America, which was then part of USIA. So I had direct contact with and involvement in the work of uh, the USIA. So let me just run through some of the programs that uh, USIA was responsible for and why they played such an important role in, uh, well, throughout the entire Cold War. I may add, I think very short-sightedly, the US closed the agency in the 1990s considering it to be, well, considering it a peace dividend that, that we had won the Cold War and that we no longer needed. I think it was, personally speaking, I think it was extremely short-sighted. I think we needed as much, if not more today than we needed it in the 1970s and 80s. And I think one of the challenges that is facing the US going forward in the 2020s and beyond is how do we have an effective 
means of communication with the rest of the world in a very globalized world that we live in. But let me just take you through some of the main kind of points of, of USIA, and you will sort of see how that fits in and how that echoes a lot of what Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty did as a separate non-governmental grantee of the US government, if you wish, kind of an arm's length from US policy. The biggest part of USIA was the voice of America. And I would say that, and, and I would encourage you, by the way, you can go on the internet, you can look up Voice of America, you can watch their TV programs, listen to their radio programs. I think it's one of the gems of America that we have it. Uh, and one that I wish more Americans knew. And, uh, you know, we talk about BBC. Uh, BBC is, and I, and I respect BBC very much, but we are no worse. And, and VOA in many ways is better. And I think we, we should be aware that we have a, and if you're Washington, if you go to Washington at any time, please visit the Voice of America building on Independence Avenue, 330 Independence Avenue. It is an amazing place where we broadcast in roughly 40 languages around the world, with hundreds of millions of people watching or listening to Voice of America broadcasts about the very, about our politics, about our life, about our culture. And it is uh, set up by law, signed by President uh, Ford in the 1970s, that Voice of America reflects all, and I stress that, all points of view in the United States. It is not the radio station of any given administration and that it, it covers whatever issues are there uh fairly and honestly and i and as a former employee of voa i think voa takes it very seriously and again in my book if you look at my book on cold war radio you will see many examples of how the voice of america handled uh, you know difficult issues whether they were the iran contra affair or whether they were other problems in the Reagan or Bush or Carter or whatever administration, doesn't really matter which administration you're looking at, you're looking at a source of information. And I think that the Voice of America, and I may add that President Eisenhower was the first president to speak on the Voice of America to the entire world. And uh, this is something that he felt very deeply about, he was very supportive of, he knew and understood as a former general that if you're going to be involved, and the Cold War was frankly a war of information. It was more a war of values and principles and ideas. Luckily, it was not a hot war where we were actually fighting the Soviet Union, but we were fighting the Soviet Union by battling for, uh, for ideas and values and how best to win than to communicate those to people living in, um, in countries under communist rule. So Voice of America, fundamental part of the uh, USIA. Another very important part, and one I wish more people knew about, and that is what we in the field, Russia field, always called the Khrushchev, Eisenhower Khrushchev Agreement on Educational and Cultural Affairs. And just to give you a taste of that, until 1957, there was really no contact between the United States and the Soviet Union, other than embassy employees in each country. There was no, and Eisenhower understood probably better than anyone else, that as the Soviet, as Stalin passed away in 53, after Khrushchev's famous 1956 speech denouncing Stalinism, this was the right time to engage Soviets in exchanges. And the United States proposed two very important, apolitical, if you wish, uh, areas for engagement. One was education, the other was culture. And if we take culture first, the agreement was the Soviet Union would send its artists, opera, ballet, theater, uh, to the United States for concert tours. We, the United States, would do equally sending artists, musicians, writers to the Soviet Union. And it was a very important first step because up until then there had been no contact. Again, 
If you think back to the 1950s, and many of you probably remember the 1950s fairly well, I hope, uh, you will remember that the Bolshoi Opera came to the United States, the ballet came to New York. These were major cultural events. Equally, America started participating in music uh, co uh, competitions and concerts in Moscow. Uh, the first, and this is a great story, uh, the first um, uh, theater uh, group that the United States sent to the Soviet Union was the opera Porgy and Bess by uh, George Gershwin. And what was amazing about it, it was an American opera, a genre that Russians associated with Europe, not necessarily with the United States, uh, American written, American sung, and primarily by an Afro-American uh, cast, which of course totally blew away uh, Soviet uh, viewers because they had been fed a propaganda that uh, Afro-Americans, Blacks in the United States had no rights, had no education, had no opportunities, and here was the Metropolitan Opera with a virtually all uh, Black cast singing Porky and Best. Great success, and, and remembered to this day as one of these, you know, monumental first steps. That continued, and I think on a small scale, it was very, very important, not just for showcasing cultural achievements, which is important, but I think for beginning that person-to-person -person contact. And as I look through some of President Eisenhower's writings and speeches, I've come across people-to-people -people contact. He greatly believed that, that at the end of the day, you had to have a path for ordinary Americans, ordinary Russians to somehow talk to each other. And so there were two other components. There was the cultural exchange, very important. There began rather small, 1958, uh, with academic exchange so that professors of history, professors of political science, uh, who knew Russian, who dealt with Soviet Union, could spend some time in the Soviet Union and an equal number of Soviet scholars could come to the United States to do the same. It was a real, honest, person-to-person -person exchange. It was initially housed at Columbia University, uh, President Eisenhower's old home, uh, and then later went on to Indiana University and finally became the International Research and Exchanges Board. To, functions to this day as a very large educational uh, exchange organization. I had the privilege of being its president for about nine years in the early 2000s. But it is that effort that began in 1958 that then grew from scholarly exchanges and then it started involving student exchanges and teacher exchanges. And pretty soon by the 1960s, we had a real system by which people studying, wanting to study the Soviet Union, and that was a deeply important national priority, I may add that there was something called the um, National of, uh, Foreign Language uh, Act that uh, designated the study of Russian as a national security priority and gave grants for the study. I was lucky to be a recipient of some of that funding, which allowed me to get a graduate degree from Columbia and other programs I participated in. That was all started, begun in 19, late 1950s uh, in the Eisenhower years. And perhaps another element that may not get enough attention is something that was a real, um, something that Eisenhower liked very much. And he wanted to showcase how Americans live. And USIA took up what I would say was a rather ambitious program called American Exhibits. And the Soviets, went along because they were able to do an exhibit of the Soviet Union in the United States as well. But the American exhibits would be showcasing how an American family lives, how an American fa family functions, what are the latest technologies. And you may, and, and you will remember this because it's very, very famous. The, the first one was the great kitchen debate. Uh, Vice President Nixon at that time went to the Soviet Union to open the first exhibit in 1959, I believe, uh, in Moscow, extremely popular, that showcased a typical American home of 1959. 
And it sparked that moment in diplomatic relations called the kitchen debate, where Khrushchev tried to debate that the communist uh, system, the Soviet system was superior, and Nixon debated that the capitalist American system was better. It captured the mood of the times. And then uh, Eisenhower made a very bold uh, gesture, something that uh, pre previous pre you know, other presidents would not have done. He invited Khrushchev to come to the United States. And again, you may recall 1959, uh, Khrushchev comes to the United States, quite a sensation, goes to uh, Disneyland, um, uh, has New York visit. It's It was a big event. And what Eisenhower really wanted more than anything was to give the ability for people on both sides to at least get a sense and a glimpse of what the other side was. To kind of bring down the tension, bring down the, you know, people you don't know and people you've never seen are far scarier and far more imposing than people that you kind of see. And I can just give you one, one example of, of what, I, what I mean. Uh, in 1981, this this was you know the height of the Cold War, if you wish. 1981, uh, I received a Fulbright, and the Fulbright um, uh, program in the Soviet Union was very much started by the by the uh, Eisenhower uh, administration. And I came to Moscow one week before the inauguration of President Reagan. You could imagine dark. It was not only cold and dark in Leningrad at that time, but the political climate in the United States and the Soviet Union was dark and gloomy. And yet our program functioned and our program continued. And I was able to do very useful research that then resulted in publications and allowed me to, to learn about the Soviet Union that, again, allowed me to become the head of uh, the Russian services of VOA and RL. And I think what that legacy showed was that having relationships mattered. And this is something that goes right back to what President Eisenhower stated many times in his speeches and his writings and his views. What I think the legacy of uh, President Eisenhower uh, is, as we look back on it, is the creation of something that uh, political scientists often referred to as a Cold War regime. And that's something that's missing today. It's very, very important. A Cold War regime is the ability of kind of written and unwritten rules, if you wish, by which two antagonists coexist in a peaceful environment. And what that means is that you can oppose, and we did, whether it was in West Berlin, whether it was in Vietnam, whether it was in North Korea, South Korea, we opposed militarily Soviet expansion and contained it. At the same time, at the same time, we sought out areas where we could deal with productively with the Soviet Union, whether they were in the field of culture, education, uh, values, arguments, present, whatever the case is, you could do both, if you wish, at the same time. You could, and that prevented the relationship from deteriorating and God forbid a cold war uh, starting up or not a cold war, but a hot war starting up. What we are missing today and what we're missing very much today as we face a very dangerous, I would argue as dangerous, as dangerous a world today as we faced at the end of World War II when the Soviet Union imposed upon the United States a Cold War. You know, I spent quite a bit of time reading declassified documents, U.S. documents from the 1940s, 47 in particular, 48. And you can see in those documents how American diplomats, our ambassador to the Soviet Union was then General Bedell Smith, who was incidentally Eisenhower's chief of staff during the war, how they kept saying, well, Soviet Union, our allies, we fought together, we fought Nazi Germany together. Why are they turning against us? Why are they uh, imposing communist rule in Eastern Europe against all the agreements of Yalta, signed in Yalta just two years earlier? And in a sense, 
you could see in there that that sense of being allies just started disappearing by the late 19 by late 1947 and then that hiatus of 47 to 57 58 when we really had no relationship we again have i would argue a cold war thrust upon the united states for years whether it was under the clinton bush administration clinton administration bush jr administration obama administration there was a desire to kind of bring russia in to the world whether it was um, through the wto the world trade organization or other organizations g7 for a while but for various reasons that takes us off on a, on a different topic about putin and putinism the cold war has come to us whether we want it or not we are engaged in a cold war similarly we have china which we try to integrate into the into the greater world community they took advantage of it they did very well and now they are opposing us and teaming up with uh with russia we have a very dangerous iran we have an unpredictable and dangerous north korea we have uh, allies that are very, very shaky, whether it's Turkey or, or India. In a sense, we are back in a very dangerous world. And I think the challenge will be to be to the kind of leadership that Eisenhower had, gave America and led America in the 1950s. We sort of need that ability to, again, build alliances, strengthen NATO, be strong militarily, but use it if at all sparingly, wisely, and preferably not at all, and develop other means by which to communicate that would then lessen the, the regime's power over its people. So let me stop at this point, and I would love to answer any questions you have, get into any area of discussion, whatever may interest you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poem. Uh, we have some time for questions, so if there is. I'm sorry. Oh, what did you think about Sputnik? Is the question, what did I think about Sputnik? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, let me start by saying I was probably in second or third grade when that when Sputnik went up, and I remember we spent a lot of time in, in, in school talking about it. Um, I think we might just see it above our above us if it flew by. Uh, no, I think Sputnik was a, a call also to the United States that we needed to strengthen science education, invest in education, invest in universities. I think it spurred not just a military, which is which was very important, but I think it, it spurred and it started in the in the Reagan administration, continued very much in the 60s and 70s. And the whole idea of putting a man on the moon, the first one kind of comes out of that competition. There was a competition. And I think this is I didn't mention one other element of, of the Cold War regime, if you wish, and that is cultural sports competition. You may recall how important the Olympics were during the Cold War, because each side tried to show that its system produced the best athletes. Its system produced the best whatever you can fill in the blank, best musicians, best artists, best scholars, how many Nobel Prizes. Everything was based on a competition basis. So Sputnik spurred uh, a tremendous investment uh, by the United States government in educational programs, science oriented primarily, but not just science that propelled the United States. And probably, I'm, this is my own view, I have no, no data baking, uh, backing it up, but my, my gut sense is that things like Sputnik made us the leader in uh, space several years later because it spurred that competition. Had we not had that competition, things may not have gone as, as quickly and as fast. Uh, for the longest time, uh, Voice of America was not allowed to transmit in the United States. Was there a specific reason why they didn't allow that? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that was called the Smith-Mund Act of uh, 1948, 
1849. I don't remember the exact date of the Smith-Mund Act, but the idea was that, you know, in general, if I can just step back for a second, and, and, and this is interesting, by the 1930s, by actually late 20s, but certainly by the early 1930s, every country in the world had an external broadcaster. Uh, BBC is the most famous, but there was Radio Moscow, there was Radio Vatican, there was uh, Radio France International, there was Radio Canada International. Every country was broadcasting programming in different languages to the rest of the world. The United States did not. And when uh, advisors to President Roosevelt at that time suggested it, the private broadcasters, ABC, uh, Mutual Radio, uh, they probably CBS, protested that if the government got involved in broadcasting, it would cut into their uh, listenership, their audience. Uh, plus, there is always the fear, and, and we have that in the United States, that somehow a government broadcaster can't be trusted, which I frankly think is not necessarily the case, but that's that's a different story, one we can debate if you wish. Um, so the VOA, Voice of America, did not start. It started only, only after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it was really the World War II that, that created Voice of America, and it functioned very importantly. Its, its first words in German were, we will bring you the news, we will tell you what happened, whether it's good for us or not. And, and probably VOA established itself very quickly as a very dependable, we would talk about our losses, something that most countries would never broadcast, that we lost a battle or we had great difficulties, wherever that may be. And coming out of World War II, there was a sense that, well, it was, a, it was part of World War II, we can, we can close it down. And only the beginning of the Cold War did that regenerate sort of power to, to Voice of America and give it a better budget and allow it to prosper. At the same time, Radio Free or Radio Liberty came into being. And the compromise, or the, if you wish, the, the resolution in Congress was, okay, you're going to have these broadcasters, but they're not going to broadcast domestically. Uh, they're not going to compete with domestic broadcasters. They're going to be strictly external. And while uh, shortwave was the only way by which you could broadcast, it was not impossible to listen to them in the United States, but they were not geared for the for this area, and so they were hard to pick up. But lots of Americans listened to them overseas whenever they found themselves. It was a way to touch base with home. People who lived overseas became regular listeners to VOA in whatever language, English probably more often the case, and that was their connection. Once technology came along and the VOA and RFERL was on the internet, there was no way in which you could in any way stop people in the United States from listening, watching. And so that just kind of died because technology overcame it. Simple, simple as that. And so it's available to any of you in any language you wish at any time. And uh, my hope is that more people would, would, would pay attention to it because I think it, it does try to give an interesting serious, thoughtful. Now, in my time, I may add, back in the 1980s, a lot of what VOA broadcasting was um, um, jazz, pop music, uh, reviews of film. It was very cultural. It was a lot, a lot of stuff about what was happening in the United States that had very little, if any, political import. Dr. Promar, I would like to, to sort of follow up what you were talking about. A question that I have is you mentioned the different sort of editorial approach, if you will, of Voice of America, the willingness to admit mistakes, the willingness to, to report news when things did not go particularly well for us. I'm just wondering if there has been any, any attempt to sort of measure the impact of that particular approach on the audiences in Europe, particularly behind the Iron Curtain, and and also how they might have measured the veracity of what was being broadcast back. Obviously, it's had an impact. But. Well, uh, there are different ways of, 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 of answering that. One is the testimony, if you wish, of the democratic leaders 
uh, in the 1980s uh, who were elected in free Poland and free Czechoslovakia and free Hungary. And the testimonies that um, even the President Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin said, you know, or, or Gorbachev said this was, Gorbachev came to our 50th, 40th, 40th anniversary of Radio Liberty in Moscow and said, you know, without, without Radio Liberty, there would have never been any change in the Soviet Union. So we have testimonials. Now, granted, that's post factum, that's after the event. It's very hard to measure during. Uh, the dissident movement, which was very important in the Soviet Union, which helped bring about the end of communist rule, I'm thinking in particular figures like Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Andrei Sakharov and others who are Jewish refuseniks who were not allowed to, to emigrate from the Soviet Union. Uh, they would not have been known. They would have been at best marginal if, if simply unknown without, without what they call foreign voices. And by foreign voices, they mean VOA, BBC, RFERL, Radio France. I mean, it's more than than just just VOA, but they were an important part of the dramatic change that took place um, uh, politically in during the Cold War. In terms of today's broadcasts, uh, yes, there's always pressure on the radios. Uh, we call them the radios, although they're mostly TV now, so it's it's probably a misnomer to call them radios. But that's just our our lingo in the field. Uh, but they, you have to stand your ground. You have a law that protects you. So, for example, I'm just just to give you a very quick uh, example. Uh, when the president of whatever administration gives the State of the Union, VOA broadcasts that State of the Union in every language, Chinese, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever. They also broadcast always the opposite party's response. It doesn't matter, you know, whatever. Uh, hearings on the Hill are covered regardless. Uh, no major story ever goes unmentioned. Uh, there are even kind of curious moments. Again, this is to jog your memory uh, from 1984, I would say. You may recall uh, President Reagan thinking that the mic was dead. Uh, he was testing it, made a statement uh, that I'm sure he regretted later which said, I have just canceled the Soviet Union. The bombers are about to, to, to go or to fly over. Remember that? I mean, you must, many of you will probably remember that. It was on every news show for God knows how long. So I was head of the Russian service of VOA. The news editor calls me up, you know, what are we, are we going to broadcast in Russian uh, Reagan's words? I mean, this is, you know, we're about to bomb you uh, on the Voice of America. And we decided, and the, director of VOA concurred 100% that of course we had to cover it. There's no way we could not cover it. Now we had to give context. We had to explain that it was an unfortunate joke, an unfortunate slip of the tongue, if you wish, whatever you want to call it, but we had to put it on. There was no wavering, well, you know, it may not look good for the White House and so forth. So yes, uh, we would get Maybe not on this case, but on although there's sometimes the embassies, but really the people who protested our broadcasts on the American side were generally the embassies in country that were trying to make some kind of diplomatic deal. And all of a sudden, something over the Voice of America uh, broadcast negative, well, perfectly valid, but negative on the story. And they would say, well, you just up upset. And we would say, look, you know, we have a different mission. We, we have a mission of presenting the news. We don't have a mission of doing diplomatic work. And I think those are issues that are, that are sometimes tricky to negotiate, but are very important. Um, we have a question from, uh, from somebody in their online audience that, um, who asked, was there an, an event or some impetus that inspired the break of communications between 47 and 50? Or, um, was, or was it simply Ike's desire to rekindle diplomatic relations that sort of put the two sides back in communication with each other? Well, I think the response uh, on the part of the Eisenhower administration was, of course, to first and foremost to the speech that Khrushchev made denouncing Stalinism. That's, that's one of the, the key moments in 1956 when at a closed meeting, I mean, let's just put it in context. This was a meeting for communist officials. This was not for the world to know. 
the uh, it's, a, it's a great story. The document was smuggled out by uh, some Polish journalists who were working for the Mossad in Israel. They smuggled out the, the secret speech denouncing Stalin and Stalin's crimes, uh, got it out of, out of, gave it to the CIA. The CIA passed it on to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. They published it. The radios then broadcast it. To the, back to the Soviet Union. So there was this loop that, that developed. But I think that is probably one major reason. And then diplomatic relations were such that uh, there was an, a sense that you could have a tentative opening. In other words, the Soviet side with Stalin gone, with Stalinism, and by the way, today Stalinism is back strong, very much back strong. So, so watch for that. Uh, that this was a, a diplomatic initiative that was worth taking. And I think that proved to be an, an important first step in, in creating what I mentioned earlier, that regime by which countries could function uh, without going to war. And I think it, it uh, we had another crisis, of course, with, with Cuba several years later, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which then reinforced that cultural and educational exchanges weren't enough. You had to have... Uh, a hotline put in, and also you have to have negotiations on um, nuclear testing that eventually led to nuclear disarmament talks and so forth. I mean, that was a process that had to begin small and then grow step by step as opportunities arose. I was a student in Germany in 64, 65, and then periodically for the next 30 some years and the BOA was very important and they knew it because they tried to jam it we could hardly hear it even in West Germany the jamming was so strong but it was not only the American push for openness but the Soviets were such blockheads and that everybody came to associate everything they said with a lie hmm so demonstrably, obviously falsehoods, and yet they persisted in it. So you had this push-pull, and that turned the population of, of most of East Central Europe, at least, uh, very much pro-American and against the Soviets. So that's just my... Uh, well, that's, that's, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. Did, if you lived in West Berlin, uh, you might know of a radio station called RIOS radio in the American sector. And RIOS uh, was the earlier version of Radio Free Europe. It was for East Germany. It was for Berlin. It was a German language radio station that um, broadcast news, broadcast what we would expect to be known, and uh, was uh, was the model for, for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Um, I... Uh, I'm old enough to have been in West Berlin during the, the Soviet times. And so I, I, I remember what what that demarcated city looked like, which is, you know, there there was your communist world on one side and your and your free world on the other. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. We and this brings us to today's problem. Um, the Soviets were crude and simple and out of touch in terms of how they presented their materials. As part of my job, and one gets paid for doing strange things, but I got paid for, for watching a certain amount of Soviet news back in those days. And it was predictable. You knew exactly what they were going to say. There was nothing very exciting. They didn't know how to appeal. That's not the case now. Uh, Russian propaganda today, Russian media is totally state-run now after a brief period when they were relatively free. And it is much slicker. It's much more, you know, they, they try to find ways in which to excite people, to get to them uh, through various means. They copy certain things from around the world. They're, they're slicker, they're better, better uh, funded. So we, we have a more dangerous, if you wish, media to compete with today than we did back in the good old days. I would say, and I, and I say this very often in my various talks, it is harder today than it was for us in the 1980s. And it was harder for, it's harder now because we had the advantage, and this is a big advantage, that communism was dying. 
nobody really believed in Soviet ideology and Soviet approach. Uh, people in the Soviet Union, Western, Eastern Europe wanted to be part of the bigger world. When I spent my Fulbright in uh, Leningrad in 81, all people wanted to know from me was how life was in the West, how life was in America. What did my house look like? How did I shop? Where did I go? I mean, there was a tremendous interest and, and very genuinely curious about this amazing life in the West. Sometimes I think they exaggerated, in many cases, you know, our life to some, some level of, of prosperity that, that was just incredible. Now that's not the case. I think now we have a, a, an angrier, more xenophobic, more inwardly oriented, more nationalistic Russia that is far more anti-Western than the people in the Soviet period that I recall in the late Soviet. So I think today's challenges are are, are very, very large. And I, and I want to sort of leave you more with thinking that, you know, what, what we were able to do in the Cold War was good. Today's generation has to really deal with that, plus I think many other very dangerous elements. Well, Dr. Pomar, if I can, um, one final question I think for you. You've mentioned um, in your presentation about the demise of USIA, about uh, some of the, the outlets created during this time period to, to promote culture, to promote, to, to have political exchanges, to, to promote communication. What, in your opinion, could we be doing now better, um, especially given some of what you've said about how things have changed in the Soviet Union and countries around the world, how media production has become slicker and more targeted. How might we improve the effort that we're making to um, communicate with with those on the other side? Well, we're doing what we can with the tools that we have. And I, I would say as a regular watcher, viewer of uh, Voice of America and Radio Liberty on a pretty regular basis, if not every day, then certainly every other day, I would say their coverage, their discussion of the war in Ukraine and what is happening in Russia and their coverage, even though they're outside, they no longer can be in country. After years of having a bureau in Russia, they of course are no longer able to do that. Given those, if you wish, um, limited resources, we're doing the best we can. That doesn't mean we can't do more and we can't do better. And I think what we're gonna have to do uh, going forward is to make strategy toward China, Russia, and other closed societies a much higher priority in terms of funding, in terms of approach, in terms of institutions. You know, I, I make this point in, in, in a lot of my uh, writings that the 1940s, what amazes me about the late 1940s and early 50s is how big Americans thought. They didn't think small, they thought big. And, and this, mind you, right after World War II, and, 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 and they still saw creation of something, funding something, doing something difficult. I think we need to put national security as a priority. And it's not just military. And, and you, the military people will be the first to tell you, as Eisenhower understood very, very well, that the military does well only when other tools are used. And the other tools include, you know, information and contact. Where and how to begin is very difficult to say because it doesn't depend on us. It depends a lot on the other side. And we spent 10 years waiting for that break in 1957, 58 to begin you know, contact. That was, that was 10 year wait. I'm not hoping, I'm hoping that's not the case now, but until the war in Ukraine ends and hopefully successfully for Ukraine, there's no opportunity. There's no possibility. As a matter of fact, no American today should enter the Russian Federation. I say that because you will be taken hostage. I mean, that's that simple. And there are several people, unfortunately, American citizens simply taken hostage because they ended up for whatever reasons on the Russian Federation. So that would have been the case in 49 and 50 and 51. So we're back to that situation. Now, the other side has to indicate that it is willing to develop some kind of context. Uh, and I think whatever administration we have, 
and I know that that has to be, but it has to be very carefully done. You don't want to give away, you know, you don't want to definitely, you don't want to sell Ukraine down the, uh, and you, you have to be very careful in how judiciously you use that. It could have to do, and just to give you one quick, it could have to do with the Arctic. You know, we have a lot of climate issues with the Arctic. We are among, Russia is among the four countries that has access to the Arctic. It's a, apolitical if you wish it's not tied to a war but it's a very good area to talk about protecting the arctic or dealing with it any kind of medical pandemics diseases those kinds of things also function during the cold war in other words you sought out areas that were to the advantage of the u.s as well as to the advantage of the soviet union so probably those would be my guess areas where you could at least begin to make tentative because the key is and this is what eisenhower understood so well the key is if you're going to be successful and peaceful you've got to have a whole a range of different tools working for you that military alone is not the answer it's very important but it's not the only answer and you have to have those tools and they have to work to the extent possible in coordination you also need intelligence Thank you. Thank you. any other questions The question was, what about TikTok, uh, Dr. Pomar, and its role in in this kind of cultural political dialogue? Uh, I'm no expert on on on, on TikTok. Um, I I would say though that the radios, again, I use that term radios, but you know, RFERL and VOA do use social media wisely. From what I understand, again, I, you know, you, you got to ask someone much younger and more, more, more hip than I am in terms of, of how to use that. But I know that I'm aware that they do. They have a very interesting U.S. Agency for Global Media, and that's the umbrella agency in Washington that oversees all of our uh, information programs, uh, has a division on technology. It's called Technology fund i believe but it's it's worth like they are working on using uh technologies vpns for example where you can't uh, access the internet uh safely politically you can use these roundabout ways by which you can you can access so they're they're working on a whole array of, of different tools that would but at the end of the day, you've got a, you've also got to capture, get to the, the younger population. We did it through, um, I don't know, the Voice of America broadcast all the Beatles in the 60s because the Beatles were banned in the Soviet Union, if you can believe that. Uh, we broadcast jazz, which you think was so apolitical. That was also banned in the Soviet Union. They developed a whole tremendous audience for, for the radios on strictly musical, but you know, reasons, not, not even political. So, and then once they listen, they would stay on for the news and they would stay on and, and become a, a regular listener. So we need to reach a younger population that may be cynical, that may be, um, I'm not necessarily the person to do it, but but I'm sure there are people in, in Washington and elsewhere who would know how best to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Palmer, thank you for your, your time and your, your presentation today. Appreciate it very much, very informative. And I uh, want to remind everybody that we are again here um, fourth Thursday of every month um, doing the our lunch learn, uh, lunch and learn. We will continue the series on waging peace um, in April. So thank you all for being here today and thank you again to, to Dr. Pomar. And our next uh, lunch and learn program will be on the uh, Suez crisis. So in, in the Suez crisis in, in April, thank you. So.